I would say, you know, from my perspective, every aspect of this snake is is really interesting and fascinating. Um, from the fact that it's able to jump, very few snakes can jump, um, to controlling itself in the air, gliding well, not failing, not tumbling out of the air, um, also the ability to turn by, by one of the species. Um, but then to land and not be injured. So my name is Jake Soha. I'm a professor at Virginia Tech in the Department of Biomedical Engineering and Mechanics. Um, I'm actually a biologist, um, but I work at the intersection of, of biology and engineering. My lab studies a range of things, and one of the things that we study are how animals move. And probably our, our biggest research subject is, is the flying snake. And what really intrigues me by these, uh, what really intrigues me about these snakes as a, a physical problem, as a biomechanical problem, is that the flying snake, when you look at it, it is a typical looking snake, aside from being uh, really gorgeous. Like these are, these are pretty animals. Um, so you look at the snake and you go, hey, you're a snake, you have no legs, you have no wings, you have no membranes that you can use to, to uh, produce aerodynamic forces. How is it that this thing is able to move through the air? And move through the air, they do with skill. So when you see them, it's not just, oh, they're falling a little bit of style. They're actually gliding and they're gliding under control. When the snake enters the air, it transforms its body. So imagine um, a cobra hooding up when it's when it's frightened or, or um, threatening. What the cobra does is it moves its ribs to flatten itself out locally. The flying snake does something similar except all the way down its body. And when it does that, it transforms into this triangular type shape where it's 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 sort of triangular at the, at the top and on the bottom. It's sort of concave, a little bit flat, and then on each edge there's two little lips that kind of project downward, which are actually aerodynamically important. Now, these snakes live in South and Southeast Asia, and some of the trees there can get really, really tall. And so if you now imagine that they are climbing the tallest tree and jumping from the tallest tree, then they can go quite, quite a distance. How far exactly? I don't know. On the web, I've seen many stories in many places where they say, oh, these snakes can go 100 meters. Well, the 100 meters thing, um, I've never seen it um, in any of my experiments. And nowhere in the literature is there an actual record of a 100 meter glide. They could do it, by the way, um, in, in theory. They're perfectly capable of it. We just have never, we've never recorded it. Now, the other most obvious and prominent feature of um, flying snakes when they in the air is that they're undulating. And what the undulation is, is the head moving back and forth and it's creating waves to the side. And those waves quickly become really big. Um, and the waves actually travel down the body um, toward the, the tail, so they're, they're traveling waves. And when you see it, you know, your, your gut reaction might be, it looks like the snake is actually swimming in the air. So when you put a snake in water, they also will, will undulate in, in somewhat similar type pattern. We didn't know what the function of that undulation was. Well, let, let me say it, there's also a coincidence and it is that I happen to be hired here at Virginia Tech. And while I was here, they built a new arts facility. And as part of the, the, this arts facility, they, they built a cube it, or something called the cube. And the cube is a black box theater that's four stories. And um, what's unique about the facility is that they designed it as an integrative place for for art and science and technology. And so they, they equipped it with a motion capture system. 
24 cameras, 23 of which we actually used, um, ringing this whole facility so that if you want to do s studies of motion, you could do it in this space. Um, and so if you're not familiar with motion capture, think about the um, animation that's used now where you, you put all these points on, on a person and then you're tracking it with multiple cameras. And then now you have this 3D representation of that, that person, right? We did the same thing except for snakes. There are a number of us in the community who do fundamental research, um, and, and our, our questions are really, or for many of us, are curiosity driven. And we do studies, you know, you know, for example, let's say you're looking at the locomotion of an insect, and you're looking at its movement patterns, you're studying when their muscles are fi firing, you're studying their material properties of their body, and someone comes along and says, well, why are you doing that? What is the what is the uh, benefit to society? And my answer is that um, that fundamental knowledge is important to society. We don't ever necessarily know exactly when that will be used, but it, but it forms a foundation for our for our knowledge. And in the case of robotics, understanding how animals move, they they do so in a in a in a broad range of ways. And if we understand what's important and what's not important, we are able to provide templates of how that thing moves. So if, if an engineer comes along and says, hey, we need something that's able to go over um, really diverse terrain where you have lots of rocks and all kinds of things, well, you go, well, you know what? Um, a multi-legged um, animal is able to handle that really easily. And so if you had people who have just been motivated by going, well, how does this, how does this six-legged insect work? You can now say, all right, here's the, here's the blueprint, here's the template, here's what we know that you need to do to design your robot. And so off you go. If you don't have those studies as a base, you're now starting from ground zero from scratch, and you're gonna spend a lot of time trying to figure it out because it can, you know, organisms are complex and these problems can be quite hard. So I, I guess I guess my overall point is that I, I'm, I'm a very strong believer in the, in the value of fundamental research um, for its intrinsic value itself. It doesn't necessarily have to have a direct application that's coming up in six months or two years. Um, we don't ever know how the, the pieces are going to fit, fit together.